Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for being here. My name is Diego Aden Morley. I'm a member of Students for a Sensible Drug Policy, an international coalition of students dedicated to sensible drug reform. Brown SSDP believes that America's drug problem is a public health issue, not a criminal one. First, I want to recognize the Political Theory Project's Professor John Tomasi's support and his support and um, his support of our vision for this event today, and also Dina Eggie, the program manager at Political Theory Project. None of this would have been possible without them, so thank you to both of them. I'm very excited and honored to introduce, in my opinion, the most exciting and unusual speaker Brown has hosted since I have been a student here. Rick Ross, also known as Freeway Rick, received a life sentence in 1996 for building and presiding over the second most profitable drug empire in American history, second only to Al Capone's. Rick has asked me to read a portion of an article by former LA Times reporter Jesse Katz, who has covered Rick's story for over 25 years. The article was published May 22, 2013 in LA Magazine. He had grown up on 87th Place, where it dead ends at the Harbor Freeway, which is how he earned his nickname, Freeway Rick. It was not uttered in awe, at least not in the beginning. To be poor and illiterate in the shadow of the 110 was to be a junky-ass freeway boy. Later, when he emerged as the first crack boss of the cataclysmic 1980s, after he went from slanging $25 rocks to wholesaling $1 million loads, that moniker sounded like a Southern California joyride, slick, agile, unfettered, one step ahead of the law. Freeway Rick got rich so fast, he began to think of himself the way a charismatic preacher might, as if God had put him on this earth to sell cocaine. It took some psychological acrobatics to ignore the sickness he was spreading, but he was good at that too. In Rick's mind, he was creating wealth, lifting up his community. The chosen one was the phrase he had used. Rick was led to the visiting room in khaki jumpsuit and plastic sandals. He is half the size you would expect, five feet six and 150 pounds, with dancing eyes and an electric smile. He had no tattoos, none of the badges of the blood crypt civil war that had tripped up so many of his generation, and no patience for getting high. He had become a vegan, which in prison meant a lot of oatmeal. Everyone who has ever met him says the same thing. How could this curious little dude have mastered a business that is supposed to be all about malice and excess? Right now, he announced, I might be more free than I ever was. Rick's voice is a blend of South Central Street and East Texas sticks, steeped in humor and hyperbole. He had begun to adopt the rosy aphorisms of the get rich genre, what the mind of man can conceive and believe it can achieve. And he was testing them out gauging their plausibility. I had known Rick to be animated and self-promotional before his arrest, sour and self-pitying after. Now, here he was, a three-striker, no possibility of parole, and he seemed to be more buoyant than ever. Maybe denial was his only prayer. Rick had plans to produce a mixtape, launch a clothing line, to stage prize fights, to film a biopic, show all the naysayers, the cops and prosecutors and moralists and cynics that they had thrown away the key too soon. Adversity would make him that much stronger. Please join me in welcoming Rick Ross. Thank you. Good luck. Thank you. where to start you know what I'm saying it's just like this is part of what Jesse Katz was talking about and and it's gonna be revealed in my documentary that we sh just finished shooting uh, should be airing around June July I'm really excited about that too but when I was in jail and I still had my life sentence but what had happened is once I had learned how to read and I started studying the law I knew I was gonna get out so when Jesse was talking to him when he was reading that article to you that was me and Jesse sitting down in the visiting room talking about what I was going to be doing once I got out of prison. And being here at Yale is part of that. I mean, at Brown, 
<laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> Being here at Brown is part of that. Uh, when, when, when I was there, I saw that since I was such a critical part of creating the drug war that now I could be a part of ending the drug war. And I knew that going around the schools and, and, and educating people, basically what I want to do is give you my insight. So when I wrote my autobiography, you're going to be able to get my autobiography, get in my shoes, and walk around and see exactly what I saw. When the writer who helped me uh, finish up the book, uh, Kathy Scott, she was the author of uh, Tupac and Biggie, The Death of Tupac and Biggie, she wrote both of those books. She said that, Rick, you took me inside of the Nickerson Gardens. You walked me through the Jordan Downs. You took me to the jungle, and you took me to South Central Los Angeles, a place that I'd never been, and, and now I understand it better. And that's what I believe my goal in life is from here on out, is to basically just show people who have never had that experience what it's like, who they're dealing with, so that maybe you have a different understanding. Maybe you will know that Rick Ross is not a monster. That, like Jesse said, the cosmetic smile, that that's real. It's not fake. I don't smile because I want somebody to like me. I smile because that's who I am. I generally like people. When I started selling drugs, I didn't start to sell drugs because I wanted to cause devastation in my community or hurt anybody. It's not the reason I started to sell drugs. I started to sell drugs because I was running away from poverty. I know what it's like to come home and there's nothing in the refrigerator. I've been there. My mom, uh, I was telling Dago a little bit about why my mom was so poor because my mom, she was a hard worker. She was a janitor. But what had happened is her and my auntie had dreams of buying a house. And they went in together to buy this house. And just as they had got the house, we got moved in, my auntie had died. So now my auntie's part of the rent money or the house note was no longer there. So it left all that burden on my mom. And what wound up happening is that a lot of the things that normal kids have, I didn't have. See, I went to school with holes in my tennis shoe. I had a hole in every one of my socks in exactly the same place because my feet were on the ground. Once I started playing tennis, I got slick and I started gluing tennis balls to the bottom of my shoe to keep my feet from being on the ground. I didn't enjoy that. I had saw other people having the finer things of life. So when the opportunity came for me to grab a hold to that lifestyle, I gravitated to it. And the way that it was brought to me was brought to me by somebody that I looked up to. My friend who introduced me to drugs, he was a few years older than I was, Michael Lawrence, rest in peace. He died uh, a few years back before I got out of prison. But I know now when he introduced me to drugs, he didn't know that it was going to cause the devastation to our community that it did. He didn't know that he was going to become a user. He became an addict. I wound up taking care of him uh, up until the time I went to prison. I paid his rent. I fed him. I made sure he had everything because I felt obligated to do that because he was the one that had introduced me. But he didn't know. So what I found out from my studies in prison and by the way, when I went to prison, I was totally illiterate. Had never read a book. Had never written a letter. Uh, couldn't recognize words more than my name, my mom's name. Just a few other words. So when he introduced me, he didn't know the problems that he was going to be causing. I didn't know the problems that I was going to be causing. But I didn't want to be in poverty, and I didn't care what it took, even if it meant sacrificing my life, that I no longer wanted to be in poverty. I no longer wanted to be hungry. I didn't want to see my mom struggling and my brothers and sisters struggling. So when I got the opportunity to get involved with selling drugs, I jumped at it. I felt that 
being able to make only $100 a day because I never thought about making thousands of dollars a day, but $100 a day was enough for me to go from being anti-drugs, totally against drugs, to saying, okay, I embrace drugs. And not only that, I found out that a lot of the things that they had been teaching me about drugs was false. Like the commercial where you see on there and they fry egg and say that this egg is your brain. Well, I found out that that wasn't true because I saw friends that was using drugs and it didn't seem like it was affecting them at all. It was only later after I got into drugs heavy that I found out that some people got hooked on cocaine. But that was a few years after I was involved. When I first started, there was no crack addicts. There was nobody on the streets pushing baskets. There was nobody that quit their job to use cocaine. I saw this a few years later. So when I first started, it wasn't the way that it is right now. So when they paint this picture of me as this monster that set out to destroy my community, I don't understand why they do it. Because I only started carrying a gun after I was kidnapped, almost. Then I started feeling, well, you know what? I got to protect myself. So I only armed myself to protect myself, never armed myself to do harm to anybody else. So when I see that the stigma that they started putting on drug dealers where we're dangerous, we're animals, I started to question it. And then when I finally got arrested and I started to study the laws, fortunate enough for me that I didn't get caught with crack. I had switched from crack to powder. Because had I got caught with crack, well, let me reform that. I never got caught physically with any drugs. I was only charged with conspiracy, meaning that you don't have to actually have the drug in your hand. You only have to have witnesses that says that they saw you with a drug. In my case, my witnesses never saw, said that they saw me with crack. They only said they saw me with powder cocaine, which was a blessing for me. Because had I got caught with, or my witnesses would have said that I was using crack, my sentence would have been 100 times worse. So where I got caught with the last time they said was 100 keys, instead of it being 100 keys, it would have been 1,000 keys. Then they wouldn't have had to charge me with the three strike law like they did and wind up making a mistake with that. Because I'm only here because the government, when they filed their case, they filed it wrong. They made some errors. <laughs> <laughs> Because technically, technically, with all the drugs I sold, I should not be standing here today. <laughs> but thankful to my prosecutor, who did go to Yale, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> he did go to Yale. He was a special prosecutor. And by him not having the crack cocaine to charge me with, he charged me with the powder, but he charged me with three strikes. Because I'd only been out of prison six months before I got arrested again. Even though I had vowed to never sell drugs again, they had figured out a scheme where they could get me back involved with drugs. Uh, when I got out the first time, I had set out to basically change my life and do some of the things that I'm doing right now. But I had a friend that kept calling me when I got home. And he kept telling me, like, Rick, why are you asking people to help you build this youth center? I was trying to build a center in South Central that I felt would have saved me. And at this center, I wanted to build where people could come in from different walks of life and intermingle with the kids from South Central who don't get to see people from different parts of life. So I was working on this center, but I didn't have the money to do it because the government had took just about everything. They let me keep a couple pieces of property that uh, wasn't really valuable. My theater, which was pretty valuable, I paid a million three for it. They allowed me to keep it, but it was really raggedy. The roof was falling in. But I wanted to create this youth center. Well, while I'm working on this youth center, Danilo calls me. And he said, Rick, why are you going around asking people to help you? You don't need help. You can make all the money yourself. And I'm thinking about it. I'm saying, nah, man, I'm trying, I'm trying to go straight. And this is on tape. He's recording our whole conversation. I said, no, I'm trying to go straight, man. I'm trying to do the right thing. 
So he keeps calling me over and over and over again. And eventually, he convinces me just to introduce him to one of my little homies that we call him. That's somebody that's under you, that's younger than you, that you know from the streets, who is still doing drugs. So I had a homie that was still doing drugs, and I hooked him up. Well, I got the conspiracy from doing that. And with that conspiracy, I had pled guilty on my first case, because once they found me guilty of the first case, it didn't matter how many they convicted me of, as long as they ran them concurrent, I was good with it, I didn't do no more time, so I was gonna be out on the streets. So I pled guilty to two or three cases. Well, when they arrested me on this last case for conspiracy, they three struck me. Well, what the prosecutor missed is that in order to be a strike, you have to go to jail, you have to commit a crime, go to jail, and get out. Then you have to commit another crime, go to jail and get out again, then you would have two strikes. Well, in my case, they arrested me one time, they took me from California to Cincinnati to Louisiana to Indiana to face trial, all under one arrest. And it wasn't simultaneous arrest, it was a continuous uh, criminal spree. So when I read the law, after I taught myself how to read, the first books I read was law books, by the way, uh, and I saw that issue in there and I brought the issue up and everybody disagreed with me and told me that, uh, that I was wrong. But I knew in my heart that what I had read was correct and uh, when I went to the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, they agreed with me totally. Because I told them, I said, well listen, from what you guys are saying that a guy can become a career criminal in one day. And one day you could get up and if you sell to 100 different people from what they were saying, you would be a career criminal. And I know that there were spots in LA where you could go out and it'd be a line of people standing there and you just walk from person to person to person selling, selling them a piece of uh, 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 drugs and that day you would become a career criminal. And I know that's not what um, our lawmakers meant when they passed that law. So when I saw it, I knew I was right, I knew I was going home, and when I was talking to Jesse Katz about what I was gonna be doing, that's what I told him. That's what I was talking under when he was thinking that I was being delusional and that I was fooling myself and that I wouldn't be standing here in front of Brown University speaking to you like I am today. And I'm excited to be here. This is like a dream come true for me. And it's just wonderful. And my life is, wow, it's just, man, I don't know. It's just everything that I wanted in life after I was in prison that I thought I could do, I'm doing now. Before I went to prison, it was no way. When I played tennis, it was no way I could have been here at Brown University. I couldn't have got accepted to this school. But because with my determination and my desire to change my life and to change myself, I did it. I read over 300 books before I left prison. And one of the things that I learned from that is that anything that I set my mind to, I can do it. I set out to, in my mind, in my own mind, and I didn't tell anybody, but I set out to change the, our drug policies because I believe that our drug policies is one of the worst things that this country is doing right now. We have over 600,000 young black men in prison right now for nonviolent offenses. <coughs> we have guys that Obama just changed the crack law about eight, nine months ago. A lot of guys got out of prison for it. He changed it from 100 to 1 to 18 to 1, which was okay. Somewhat. But I felt it should have been equal, one to one, for crack and powder, they're equal. They, everybody has agreed that crack and powder are both the same drugs. So if they're the same drugs, they should be treated the same way. And not only did they not make them equal, but there's guys that have been in prison right now 25 and 30 years. And had they been awarded the 18 to 1, would have got out immediately. But what they did is they stopped the law and they said it's not retroactive. They said this law is only gonna affect people that got arrested after 2005. So guys that was arrested in 88, 87, those guys don't get the benefit of the new law that they just passed that they said was illegal. Once they said it was illegal, if it was illegal in 2005, it was illegal in 88. And I feel that those laws should be changed just like the new laws change. But worse than that, I believe that our drug policy 
is like a meat grinder. And it just keeps grinding and grinding and finding new people to pull in. Why do I say that? Because when they took me off the streets, 10 or 15 guys moved in to start making the money that I was making. Once you take a drug dealer off the street, the price of the drug goes back up because the supply dries up. When there's no supply, then the demand goes up. It's just like any product that you get. When you can't get it, when gas is low, the prices goes up. When, glass, when gas is plentiful, the price goes down. Well, it's the same way with drugs. When I was selling drugs, drugs in my community was plentiful. After they arrested me, it wasn't so plentiful until somebody else moved into my spot and started to run the drugs business the way that I ran it. Until that happens, there's multiple guys that are sharing in that money. When the price goes up, it also attracts people to get involved that normally wouldn't get involved. What do you mean by that, Rick? Well, what I mean is that if a kilo is worth 70000 and the person who sells that kilo can make 20, then there's more people that would be willing to make that 20,000. Now, if you drive the price down to where a kilo is only worth 12,000, and the person who's selling that kilo is only gonna make 2,000, and then the person knows, well, if I get caught with that kilo, I'm gonna get 10 years in prison, then the person is less likely to take the 2,000 rather than the 20,000. More people will be willing to take a penitentiary chance for 20,000 than they will for 2,000, is what I'm trying to say. So I believe that our drug laws creates this artificial price for cocaine and other drugs to increase the desirability for our people to want to get involved. Because if there's no money involved, dealers don't want to be involved. And those are the reasons that I go around and I speak at colleges and high schools and just everywhere I go, you know, just to spread the word and let people know that we have to make a change. We have to make a stand. And our politicians sometimes, they're so caught up in what's been happening instead of what needs to happen. And it's going to take you because you are going to be our leaders in the future. You're going to be our next presidents, our next senators, our next councilmen. And you're going to have to be sensible enough to say, you know what, why are we going to keep a guy in prison for 45 years? I mean, why are we going to keep a person in prison for $45,000 a year and he's not going to kill anybody? He's not going to rape anybody. He's not out taken from anybody. And just the possibility that he maybe he learned his lesson and he's never going to sell drugs again. Because some of these guys, when they go to prison with us, I don't know, we, we, we're like what I call entrepreneurs. And we're looking to be productive. One of the worst things about going to prison is, is for, for, for me was not being productive. To be sitting in a cell 24 hours a day looking at walls and thinking. I mean, the thinking part was good, but the not being productive part was really bad. And I found that out about a lot of the guys that I grew up with, that I started selling drugs with. We were all trying to figure out how could we be productive. I don't know if you ever heard of the record label Death Row Records. Well, me and Harry, yo, the guy who gave Suge the money to start Death Row, we were sellies. And one of the things that he had did while he was in prison is that he constantly read and constantly looked for ways to be productive. Harry has been in jail now about 30 years. Uh, his whole thing wasn't nonviolence. He had some violence in, 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 his, in his case. But what I'm saying is that he was always looking for ways to be productive, even inside of prison. I was looking for ways to be productive. Most of the guys who came to jail, who made money selling drugs inside of prison, look for ways to be productive. So saying that, I don't believe that we need to keep these guys in jail 30 years. I don't think that they should be in jail for life. Young Tommy was another guy. I gave him his drugs. The first drugs that he ever received, I gave it to him. He went to jail at 22 years old. And because he had made $4 million, they gave him a life sentence. He had five people working for him. 
They gave him a life sentence. He's been in jail like 25, 30 years almost. And the guy's been to college. He's got his college degree since he's been in jail. He's totally reformed. And I believe that once these guys make certain, at least, if, if we don't change the drug policy, at least we have to do, put mechanisms in where once a guy shows a willingness or an ability to change, that it should be some type of mechanism that they can go to a parole board or go somewhere and say, look what I've done with my life. Look how, I, look how I've changed. Can I go home to my family now? We don't have none of those mechanisms in. So it don't matter how good you do, how well you reform, you still can't go home. And I think that's crazy for us as taxpayers to now pay $45,000 a year. Tommy is only right now maybe 40 years old. He's probably going to live, because this guy works out every day. The guy does 1,000 burpees every single day. <laughs> I'm talking about he's like rock man. <laughs> Not only is he smart, because this kid is smart, too. I'm talking about 22 years old, and he had already made $4 million, and that's just what the government estimated. I mean, <laughs> <laughs> so the kid was really smart. He took, he took what I was doing and did it better than, than I was doing it. He was going to be better than me at what he did, because what he did is he was able to watch me. See, I didn't have a teacher when I came up. I was learning by trial and error. But this guy had somebody that he could mold himself after, and he was doing it really well. But saying that is that now we're going to have to take care of him for 40 more years, and we don't need to. Because this guy is a diehard uh, Nation of Islam Muslim. He follows uh, uh, Louis Farrakhan. He's the preacher at the prison. When the young guys come in, he grabs them, brings them into the nation, and tries to stop them from selling drugs, stop them from gang banging, and all this type of stuff because he knows now that this is what ruined his life. So what better way to have people like this coming back to the community, teaching our young people, hey, look, this is going to ruin your life, than to throw away the key and say, you know what, we're going to pay 5 or $10 million for the next 40 years to keep you in prison. I think it's crazy. And those are the reasons that I'm going around right now talking. I also teach at a high school in LA. It's a uh, continuation school. Um, it's really unique. <laughs> uh, these kids are amazing. Uh, and a lot of them don't think much of themselves. You know, most of them, mothers or fathers, probably been in prison. Uh, so they grew up on the streets by themselves. Uh, most of them been in a juvenile detention center or juvenile hall. And one of the main things that I try to get to them now is that they are important, that they do count. Because when you don't think that you count, then you wide open for anything. Whatever happens, happens because you don't even count no more. It doesn't matter. And it's important for all of us to let other people know that they do count. Because we're all a part of one system, and what affects them affects you. And it may not affect you directly, it may be years down the line when it comes back, but it affects all of us. And I believe that it's all of our job to figure out ways to make society better. And that's what I'm setting out to do with my life. I set out to make society better. And hopefully uh, today I shed some light on you about my story, what I've been going through, what I'm going through. And right now there's no ceiling for me. I mean, I think that I can do anything that any other man has ever done. Uh, I didn't always think that way. I didn't always think that I was just as good as everybody else. But now I know I'm just as good as everybody else, and I think that everybody else is great too. <laughs> and I treat them like that. And that enables me to do the things that I'm doing. Uh, Wow, I'm going to tell you a few of the things that I'm doing right now, and then I'll take some question and answers. Uh, one of the things I'm really, really excited about is my autobiography comes out next month, the 13th. I hope that everybody gets it, <laughs> checks it out. It's going to be a bestseller. <laughs> you know why? Because I made up my mind when I was in prison. I read a lady, and she wrote her book, and she said she was a nobody. But she sold a million copies because she said she knocked on every door and ask them, will you buy my book? I'll autograph it. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm going to take a note out of her book. And I've been doing it right now with my t-shirts. I started a t-shirt company. I sold last year 
close to 12,000 t-shirts out of my trunk with her philosophy that I'm going to walk up to everybody that I meet and offer them a t-shirt. <laughs> and I do it. So be looking for my autobiography. Uh, I, I slipped up. I was trying to bring my documentary down here so you guys could see a clip of my documentary. Uh, but I, I, I messed up. I didn't get to do that. So we're going to bring the whole doc back. When the doc get ready to come out, you know, I'm going to come here and screen it. Uh, Mark Levin did it. I don't know if you know who Mark is, but Mark is one of the greatest documentarists in, in the world right now. Uh, he's taught some great people. Uh, if he don't win uh, uh, the prize every year, it's one of his students who, who wins it. So Mark did Slam. He did Banging in Little Rock. He does Brick City. He does one in Chicagoland. He just did Chicagoland. It's coming on CNN right now, the series. Uh, he's a phenomenal director, and, and I really love working with him. Uh, I've learned a lot from working with him, even though we bump heads a few times. Uh, but overall, you know, our relationship is good, and that's coming along. Also, I've been working on a movie, too. Uh, uh, I wrote my movie script with Nick Cassavetti. Uh, Nick did Blow, Alpha Dog, The Notebook. Uh, Nick is one of the top directors and writers in Hollywood, so me and him have been putting my movie together. You know, he wrote my script too high. <laughs> he wrote my script, came back at the budget is like 36 million, so everybody like, we ain't doing no 36 million dollar movie on you. <laughs> 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 but other than that, it's been, you know, it's been an experience to work with him, and, and, and you know, once you give yourself a chance, there's just so many other things that you can do. Uh, I got a couple acting roles that, that, that I picked up. Um, I even did a rap song a couple weeks ago we <laughs> with this guy named Big Stye out of Virginia. He, he wrote everything for me and told me I could do it. We went to the studio and we, we did it. It came out pretty good. So, I, I mean, I'm just, I'm just trying different things now. You know, uh, one of the things that I know that I had did to myself is that I didn't give myself a chance at, 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 at other avenues. And one of the things that I was boxed in my community, you know, I didn't see much. So we got to give ourselves a chance to, to grow and expand. And, you know, in one of my favorite books, Think and Grow Rich, he says that you have to take chances. The only chance you don't take is a chance that's going to take your life or a chance that's going to take your freedom. And those are the two things that I missed when I was doing my other business uh, because I did put both of those on the line. You know, I put my life and my freedom on the line when I sold drugs, and I understand that now. Um, but now I'm willing to take chances. I don't mind taking chances. Uh, that's just part of life. So uh, those are some of the things that I'm doing right now. Uh, I have a couple websites uh, for my T-shirt. I have one, uh, Freeway Social Media, so anybody want to get one of my T-shirts? The, the real Rick Ross is not a rapper. <laughs> <laughs> you can pick those up off my website. And uh, I'm open for question and answers. Remind me of that. You gotta remind me of stuff. I forget. You know, I ain't, I ain't no brainiac like y'all. <laughs> I'm kind of slow. You know, my books say I got a slow mind. Uh, yeah, he wanted me to talk to you a little bit more about my tennis. Uh, I, I played on my high school tennis team was one of the best tennis teams in the country. Uh, we were the best black tennis team, hands down, in the whole country. Arthur Ashe came out uh, when I was in the 10th grade and gave awards to uh, to, to my best friends. Uh, I had a friend who went and played for UC Santa Barbara, and me and Dago was talking about it today, I think, when we were doing an interview, and I told him one of the reasons that I didn't gangbang, because I did want to be a gangbanger when I was about 12 years old. When I was about 12 years old, I saw, uh, I don't know if you ever heard of Big Tookie, but he was executed, and uh, when they executed him, I was in prison, and, and uh, not only did I feel sorry for him being executed, but I also, uh, felt grateful for myself because I know at one time I would have followed him like a loyal soldier and had it not been for me starting to play tennis. So tennis kind of like saved my life. I, I, I felt, and I still feel that tennis saved my life uh, because when I was around 12 and a half, 13 years old, I started to play tennis. And tennis took me out of South Central Los Angeles and took me to an area where I was able to experience things that my brothers and sisters didn't get to experience. Uh, all my younger brothers and sisters all gangbang. 
they got the tattoos and everything, you know, over their bodies where they represent their sets. But tennis took me away. I was a good enough athlete to go to a college. Um, I had the privilege to go to UC Santa Barbara where my best friend played number one at UC Santa Barbara. I had another friend that played one and two at uh, Bakersfield University. I had another friend that played for San Diego State. Another one played for UC Irvine. Uh, so I was exposed to a different lifestyle than a lot of my friends that grew up with me in South Central. Uh, I have a lot of friends right now that has not from selling drugs, but from other crimes that are doing a lot of time in prison. And I have a lot of friends that I've known that have died from, from gangbanging. So tennis definitely, without a doubt, gave me time to develop, to pick an avenue that wasn't as detrimental to me as some of the other things that I could have been doing. I was 19 years old when I, when I uh, found out that I wasn't going to be going to college and that I was back on the streets. Uh, the other thing is the CIA. I don't know if you know, but when I was going to trial, it was discovered by this reporter out of San Jose Mercury News. He contacted my lawyer and he was like, um, I want to talk to Rick. So my lawyer's like, well, Rick getting ready to go to trial. What you want to talk to Rick about? You know, lawyers try to protect you from the media because the media can do things to your case and, and, and make your case worse than what it was. So my lawyer called me. He said, well, I got this reporter who wants to talk to you, and uh, I don't know if you should talk to him or not. And I was like, well, what, what you scared of? You already told me I'm getting a life sentence. I mean, what worse can they do? They can't give me the electric chair. <laughs> I want to talk to the guy. Tell the guy to come and see me. So the guy comes down, and he sees me. We start to talk, and now my informant, I knew him, but I didn't really know him. You know, I'd been by his house, but I never asked him his last name. I never asked him where you come from or what are you doing with your money. I never asked him any of that stuff. You know, it was none of my business. Keep giving me my drugs at a cheap price and keep giving me good drugs. That's what I wanted. So when Gary comes down and he starts to talk to me about this guy, he's like, man, you don't know what you was into. And I was like, yeah, I know what I was into. I made a lot of money. <laughs> he was like, no, it's bigger than that. I said, yeah. He said, I'm going to tell you more about it as we get to talking, but I want you to tell me everything that you know about this guy. So I started filling him in with everything that I knew about the guy and, um, and so forth. Well, he didn't give me what I wanted right off the bat. It took him a little while. He was kind of scared because he knew I had a relationship with the guy, Jesse Cash from the LA Times, that I was going to give away his story. But eventually, uh, Gary came to court during my trial. He sit there right with my lawyer, and he helped my lawyer with my trial. My, my judge even said one time, uh, why do you keep conferring with a news reporter inside the courtroom? Uh, that's, not, you know, that's not court procedure. So anyway, after my trial, Gary finally released his article. The day that he released the article, I read it, and then I called Gary, and I talked to him on the phone. And he explained to me why he had never told me that this guy was tied to the CIA. Uh, and after they did that, I started to really do more research about the Contras and, and their whole movement. Now, it was hard for me to believe that here I am, a guy who started in the drug business. I only started with $125 that I had made it up to where I was tied to the army that protects the United States. That was really hard for me to believe, even after it came out in the paper. I, I didn't believe it until the CIA did their report and said that, yeah, we knew these guys were selling, that our army was selling drugs. It wasn't a straight out admission, but it was enough for me to say, yeah, this is true. The CIA admitted that they knew that my informant and his bunch were selling drugs, that they also had put in a report to go to the Attorney General and ask her that they didn't have to report them. So for me, that was just equivalent, because if somebody would have did that for me, if the police would have said, okay, well, you ain't got to worry about us reporting you, and we're going to go ask our boss if we don't have to report you. I mean, to me, that's enough is you involved in the drug business with me. So when I read that, it let me know that the CIA definitely had a role in this, to what magnitude or 
how far I didn't know. Uh, I was really upset with the way people did Gary Webb. You know, they tried to take his story and say that he said that the CIA deliberately put drugs into the black community to devastate the black community, and, and I don't believe that's what he said. Uh, I think he said that that's what eventually happened. But so many people twisted his words to the point to where he either committed suicide or was killed. We don't know for sure. Uh, the, the autopsy reports say that he committed suicide, shot himself in the head twice. Um, <laughs> but it was amazing that after, after the CIA admitted that they was at least knowledgeable of what was happening, that the public still doesn't know that, that this took place. And I think it's very important for us as citizens to know that if our government is playing both ends of the stick, where they're allowing drugs to be brought into the country and then they turn around and incarcerating the people who gets involved with drugs, that something is wrong with that. So that's another reason why I'm doing what I do, and I will continue to do this. Is that it? Okay. Thank you. So we have an extensive period for question and answers. I know there's some microphones set up, so if you have a question that you're interested in asking, please uh, just come line up. Otherwise, there are a few things I would uh, I would ask, so. Where can we get your book? Uh, yeah, no. go ahead and answer that. She's <laughs> next. If you could line up at the microphone, that'd be great when you can, yeah, but that's all right. You get the, book. the book will be out May the 13th, and the best place to buy it is off my website, Rick Ross Book. <laughs> <laughs> hey, what did you mean when you said that crack and pot are the same thing when you were talking about the 18 to 1? Say that again. <laughs> What? Powder. Powder. Okay, thank you. Never mind. It was my fault. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry. <laughs> Hi. So you were saying that when you take um, when you take a drug kingpin out of the community, right? The supply goes down, and then the price goes up, and that gets more people involved. Correct. I was wondering, what's the alternative to that? Because should you know, can you just leave a drink, a uh, uh, drug kingpin on the street? You know, like I feel like the, uh, like law forces have to take those people off the streets. So what's the alternative? Well, I don't know the alternative yet, but we do know that the, the current drug policies are not working. Uh, we know that our prisons are, are bulging. That they're letting dangerous criminals out of jail, people who rob, rape and kidnap out of jail early so that they can make room for drug uh, offenders. We know that cops have taken on the mentality that you get raised, get raises faster and you get promoted faster by arresting drug dealers and confiscating money than you do by solving a murder. So what they'll do is they'll say, you know what, I'm not gonna solve murders, I'm gonna go and catch drug dealers. And I think that's something that we need to start discussing as a society. So, uh, what's up? Uh, so, they gave us these pamphlets that says, drug kingpin turned reformer. And uh, so, you went to prison for a while, 20 years, and now you're out, you're doing this. You're, uh, you're in movies, uh, like, you're, you have a good name, everyone knows who you are. Uh, and I'm just curious, at the end of the day, do you regret this? Do I regret selling drugs? Yeah. Um, wow. That's a good question. Um, if I had it to do over today, I wouldn't, knowing what, who I am right now today. But I do understand who I was when I first started selling drugs. When I see people selling drugs right now, I know who they are because I've been here. And I know what they're up against. And did we get it right? Did we get our mic right? Excuse me one second. Did we get my right? I'll go back to the podium. Okay. I'll go the podium back. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah, so you said, do I regret 
selling drugs. Just considering where you are today, you know. Well, well, I'm not totally here where I'm at today because I sold drugs. And people want to do that. They want to do that to me to discredit the reform that I did. See, they don't want to give me credit for reading 300 books. They don't want to give me credit for reading 15 books on just marketing alone. They don't want to give me credit that I read about Google and Facebook and MySpace and, and all the other stuff that I did, that I learned the law. I turned myself into a lawyer when I was in prison. See, they don't want to give me the credit for that, but they want to give me credit for that I did sell drugs. Yes, I sold drugs. I went to prison. I went to trial. They gave me a life sentence. I figured out how to get the life sentence off of me. So all that's part of who I am today, and drugs is just a part of it. See, I haven't sold drugs in 30 years. So, no, I would never sell drugs again. But I don't regret who I am today. I love who I am today. Thank you. Thanks. Um, so it seems like any time a business is focused on a contraband, you know, it will eventually become associated with violence and other, you know, maybe originally unintended consequences of that. And as long as the product is contraband, um, then the, biz the business would have to kind of direct that way. But the policy on drugs is twofold because there's the one end that you've been speaking of, of what you do with the people involved in the business. The other end of it is the people who are using and the people whose, whose lives are affected by using the drugs. Correct. Um, and I was curious if, you know, growing up in an impoverished area where people did use and then being involved in the business and getting exposed to a lot of that, um, you know, one, one way of reducing the amount of people who have to end up in jail uh, because of, of being involved in a business of drugs is if there's less people who want to use the drugs. I was curious if being as folks to that, you have any ideas of maybe how we could minimize use of drugs? Well, I think the way we stop people from using drugs is by educating them. Uh, I think people that use drugs use it out of ignorance. People who sell drugs sell drugs out of ignorance. But I don't think you can separate the two. I think that right now, if you had a magic wand, and you could wave this wand today and say, all drug dealers are off the street. Well, as soon as you do that, drug users are going to start creating them another drug dealer. Because that's how it works. Drug dealers, drug users taught me. See, I was a total novice. I knew nothing about drugs. I didn't know what it looked like. I didn't know the color of it. I didn't know what it smelled like. But drug users turned me into a drug kingpin. They told me, Rick, don't use. I'm talking about drug users, people who were sitting there hitting the pipe right in front of me. They hitting the pipe, suck it, get the smoke out, blow it out, and say, Rick, don't you never do this, and go right back. <laughs> you know why they did that? Because they wanted me to stay where I got the price, where they knew they was going to get good drugs at the right price, where they knew that if they went on the street, they wasn't going to get robbed. And they knew that I was going to do that. And they knew if I started using, that that could change. So I believe that drug users will create new dealers. And if you take off all the users, dealers will create users. So I believe that it should be dealt with simultaneously as a team and stop individualizing people and, and demonizing people because they're all people and they're all making mistakes. And we all need to correct it together. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, first I want to say welcome home. Um, there's life after death. We just have to learn to die to some things in order to be able to live to others. And I learned that through my own experience. I grew up up the street from here. My son actually went to Brown. He graduated uh, last year. He went on a full academic scholarship. I believe he scored in the top 15% in this country. But me, I was just released from prison, I say like four and a half years ago, because I was caught up in the game in the early 80s. Yeah, the yep. early days, I dropped out of middle school. It wasn't that I was stupid, I just didn't believe in school. And crack was introduced to the neighborhood. Well, cocaine, and that's what we gravitated to. And I think the customers, because most of the customers that we had were actually down here, because I used to hang down Brown. I used to hang down Brown in the keg parties, and most of the customers were Johnson and Wells and Brown students. And that's nothing against Brown. I'm just telling you how it was in the 80s. Because I used to hang in keg parties with Grateful Deadheads, and we used to just, that's what we did. We partied. We partied down here. But the, the crazy thing about it, is, at least to my question, is that most of the people that I grew up with, because I'm from Mount Hope, it's right next to Hope High, 
we all got incarcerated, and none of the people that was down here, none of them really got incarcerated. So do you think that drugs was not intended? Because it's crazy, because you're saying 45000 Actually, it's in the state of Rhode Island, it's $50,000 a year to incarcerate one indiv individual. And I know because I deal with A.T. Wall a lot, which is the director of the prisons now, because I've been so rehabilitated, I came out, got my degree, the whole nine. But why does it cost $50,000 a year to incarcerate somebody, yet you probably don't even spend $50,000 a year to go to school here. But yet we can find $50,000 a year, and the jail is filled with overwhelmingly a majority of minorities. So why is that? Do you think there's a connection between um, the decimation of the community and the policies that are set forth, or do you think this is just an accident? Well, we definitely know that, that the laws are, are not blind to color. Um, when I went to trial, there was three blacks in the courtroom, and all of them were sitting beside me. Mm -hmm. So other people are making money off of the drug business, and, and not just drug dealers. I'm talking about police officers. D agents, DA agents boost up the numbers of drugs. Say like in my case, my, my co-defendant, who I got arrested with on my last case, he was all right drug dealer, but he wasn't a 100 kilo guy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and the judge, was so adamant at knowing that he wasn't a 100 kilo guy that she gave him a sentence reduction because she saw that the police had boosted up the drug quantity. And this was not my drug deal, this was his drug deal. And they tried to use me saying, oh, well, Rick has done 100 kilo drug deals, so therefore everybody involved was 100 kilo drug deals. But we found out later on that DEA get boosted by how much drugs they find. So if they go in and they arrest 10 people and they say each one of them had 100 kilos, that increases their budget. So absolutely, it's racially motivated. I definitely believe that it is. Thank you. Hi, um, so earlier you were talking about when you first entered um, drug dealing that it was essentially um, an economically uplifting thing, not only for you, but potentially for the community that you were in, in ways. Um, and I was hoping you could talk a little bit about what it's like, the hierarchy, um, and in a community, like what essentially, how you're seen by the community, what that looks like, um, and whether that for you morally changed as you got further into the 80s and the crack epidemic became more visible. Okay, I'll try to. Well, when I first started selling cocaine, it wasn't in, in my area. It was a Hollywood drug, you know, Quincy Jones and Rick James and Sly and the Family Stones. And the people who I looked up to were doing it. So when I got involved, I felt like I was bringing a piece of Hollywood down to my area who wasn't allowed to go to Hollywood. And it stayed like that until to about 84, and that's when I started to see uh, the hypocritiness in myself, to where I started to say, like my girlfriend at the time, when, when, when I first met her and we first started going out together, I was giving her cocaine. Well, later on, I started saying, you know what, you gotta quit using cocaine. So, it was probably around 84 that I first decided that cocaine was something that I didn't want my people using, I didn't want my brother using it, I didn't want my cousins using it, and I started to see that I was trying to have it both ways. So hopefully that answered your question. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I was wondering, how is it that you were able to avoid gang banging um, while also being so prominent in the drug business? Well, I, I was lucky enough, like I said, that I played tennis up until I was 19 years old. And then when I was 19 years old, I was smart enough to make the distinction that uh, I wasn't going to be beating anybody up from what color they was from, what color they wore, what neighborhood they was from. Uh, and it really benefited me, too, because that gave me to, the ability to go to any neighborhood and, and sell them drugs, even though, like, sometimes I would go. You know, in my book, I described by going into Nickerson Gardens, and they knew that I wasn't from there, and they knew that I was from a crip neighborhood, but I didn't gangbang. But they did sweat me. Well, what I call sweating is, you know, say certain things to me to invoke to see if I was going to, you know, go back with them, you know, like they would call you uh, a ricket. 
in, in L.A. to a crip, that would be something to fight about if they call you a ricket. So I was old enough to make a, a choice at 19 years old that I don't believe if I didn't have tennis at 16, I wouldn't have been able to make. I probably would have been a gang member. So I was old enough at the time not to go that route. Thank you. Looking back on your years of selling and the changes in your community that accompanied them, could you say there were any positive impacts as a result of your business, or was it entirely a negative enterprise? Well, you know what? It, it, it all turned out to be negative. Uh, there's a saying that you can't do uh, negative things and expect positive things to happen, uh, and that's what we was looking for. Uh, we were looking for positive things to happen, you know, to start our own businesses, to give ourselves a jump start. Is really what I was looking for when I got into the dope businesses, just to give myself a boost up. You know, I didn't have an uncle or auntie or anybody that I could call and say, hey, you know what, I got a great business idea. I want to start a body shop. I need $10,000. Can you loan it to me? I, I never had that opportunity. Like I said, I started in the drug business with $125. Uh, I took that $125 and I parlayed it up to... Uh, my last two years where I was making at least a million every day and sometimes $3 million. But I did that strictly on parlaying it. But at the end of the day, uh, there's no winners in the drug business. It's, it's, it's a, a, a dead end street for everybody. Thank you. Uh, being an advocate of uh, reforming the American judicial system and having experience, having a lot of experience inside it, uh, what would you say is the single biggest change that you would like to see in the American judicial system? I would really like to see our politicians at least face the facts, you know, to, to come in and say, you know what, this drug war is not working. You know, we've been fighting it for 50 years. We've spent hundreds of billions of dollars on it. It's not working. Let's bring some new minds in. Let's let them figure out some different ideas on what we should be doing. We, we, we do know, too, that, that, that education beats incarceration. They've done studies where they can show, where they show. I, I saw reports from the RAM report while I was in prison. Uh, I, I, was, I turned into an advocate reader. I read the Wall Street Journal, the USA Today. Um, I read like four newspapers just about every day, skimmed through them. And there was reports that came back that say that they know that education was better than incarceration. So I would like for our politicians to, to, you know, just start telling the people that we know that this doesn't work and that we want to get some of the fresh minds in here to, to figure this thing out. And I think that you guys are the ones that's going to have to do it. How's it going? Uh, you know, I did some research on you before coming here and saw, you know, that you made millions and millions of dollars throughout your time selling drugs. And I was just wondering, was there ever a time where you thought, you know, I need to get out of here, disappear, take the money and run, flee the country or whatever? Or did you feel that, like, your life was so consumed by drugs, drug dealing, and that you wanted to or you had to keep selling drugs? Well, even though I had money, I still was confined in, in my thinking. You know, um, we were talking about it this morning it, with Dago, as, as we sit at the table, I believe, in uh, one of the interviews, and I was telling him that, I didn't have anybody around me to come up and say, hey, Rick, why don't you open up a McDonald's and that's a great place to put your money. Because I was always looking for places that I could put my money that would take me outside of the drug business and uh, I never found that. Thank you. And I didn't know nowhere to go either. You know, where was I gonna go? All I knew was South Central. Um, you talked about this a little bit already, just kind of how we kind of need new minds and politicians to assess these issues. You talked a lot about kind of the loopholes in the legal system and how they kind of contributed to your incarceration, getting out of jail. In terms of specific public policy reforms, do you think like there are any kind of particular routes that we should be taking? Uh, well, for groups, uh, I like the, um, ah, I can't think of the name of it right now, the group that uh, George Soros starts started. I think that they're great. There's uh, families against uh, minimum mandatory sentences. Uh, I think that they're doing a good job in, in reforming and, and uh, putting people out. You know, I used to read that newspaper when I was in jail, and they show a lot, of, a lot of people that had made changes while they was in prison. And, you know, some people that was even innocent. You know, there was people who, uh, one girl that I read about, uh, her name was Jennifer Scary, and she had one of, the, one of the craziest stories I ever heard. 
her boyfriend sold crystal meth, and she knew who his connection was because connection came over to the house and they did a few deals inside of the living room where she was sitting there. Well, her boyfriend's cousin turned into an informant and came over and threatened to kill one of her kids if she didn't introduce him to the connect. And when she did that, uh, they arrested her and gave her 15 years for it. So uh, Families Against Minimum Mandatories is one of the groups that I would recommend uh, checking on. Thanks. I just, for the last question, did, you, did she say groups or roots? Oh, I said groups. Roots, yeah, oh, so like roots. any like policy, specific policy reform, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, no, I don't know, none, off, none, none right offhand, no. I thought you said groups, <laughs> I'm sorry. Uh, how do you feel about the um, drug culture presence in hip hop and the influence it has on like the youth, in particular the black youth? I think that it's crazy that our politicians are allowing them to uh, sell dope on wax. Uh, because if, I if they would have ever had me on, on record saying that I sold kilos, they would have took that to court. I mean, because they took me to court with somebody else saying that I sold drugs and me saying that he's lying. So if they would have had me on record saying that, yeah, I sold hundreds of kilos of cocaine, I made millions and millions of dollars, that was enough for a jury to find me guilty. So I think that what they're doing right now is, is, is really criminal almost, you know, because they, they're setting a, a culture for the young people to believe that you can go out and sell drugs and take that money and parlay it into a rap career, and, and that's not the case. I just want to thank you again for coming as well. Um, but you mentioned how drug use um, originated in, in desperation, devastation, so did drug dealing. And then after those two things took place, uh, people are trapped in the uh, prison uh, industrial complex. Um, and that's a devastating cycle as well. And you've mentioned a deep skepticism in government reform. Um, and I was wondering, uh, in this kind of large scale policy issue, there's usually a hope for government reform. But do you think that reform comes more from private actors like yourself or from groups that you mentioned previously or from a new, a new take from our federal or state government? Well, you know, everything starts from one person. You know, one person gets a thought. Uh, I mean, the drug policy, all this started with one person. And he, he pushed the policy on to the rest of the world, to where, where the rest of the world bought into it and believed that uh, we should get tough on crime. And then one politician bought into it, and another one bought into it, and another one bought into it until it's where it's at today, where you know it's almost that everybody believes that you know we should be tough on drug dealers. So I believe that one of us could start the ball rolling, and you know if it's me, so be it. Then I'm going to take that ball and start rolling it. But I think that you could do the same thing, or any any of us, all of us could work together to to reform the policies and and to just get this thing straight. So as a, as a quick follow-up, for someone who, who wants to be able to change that culture, would you suggest going into politics or would you suggest doing it uh, in a private setting? Uh, I think we should do everything that we can. If you can get into politics, then you should go into politics. Uh, we need more politicians that uh, that's going to do what the people want done. I mean, uh, you look at it in, in, in some states like California, you know, the people voted to, to legalize marijuana and the politicians still didn't want to go with it. You know, they still wanted to bucket, you know, for years until uh, just recently now that they, they started. And even now, you know, they're talking about uh, taking people licenses that have the license to sell marijuana in, in dispensaries. They want to number, uh, limit the number of dispensaries that they're going to allow. So what they're going to be doing, if you limit the number of, of dispensaries, then the price is going to go back up. So you're going to be right back where you was before. So. Uh, our politicians, they're just crazy, you know? They don't know what they're doing. They're trying to look for ways where it look like they're earning their money. You know, a guy comes out and he do some work in the yard and he didn't do nothing and he just, you know, tells you, oh, well, you need this done and you need that done and just create stuff that you need done and you really don't need it done. So I believe that that's what our politicians are doing right now, justifying uh, their salary and, and we need to get people in there that's really gonna work for us. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you for coming and, you know, taking time to provide us with this great lecture. No, thank um, you for coming. <laughs> I'm honored uh, to be question, here. question is, moving forward with your foundation and everything, what's the biggest goal you hope to achieve with... Um, with my Literacy Foundation? Reform? Yes, yeah. Wow. Well, you know, one of the things that, 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 that I'm an advocate about is not being able to read. 
And then even, even after people read, a lot of people don't understand what they read. Uh, so I'm really, I'm really hard on that. I'm really pushing that hard, and that's why I named my, uh, my foundation, Freeway Literacy Foundation, is because I'm finding out, because I go to juvenile detention centers too. I, I'm not allowed to go into the prison system yet, and I can't wait until uh, I get off parole and I can start going into the prison systems and, and talking to the prisoners and let them know that they should be thinking a certain way and, and, and functioning a certain way. And they want me to come in there too. Uh, but I'm really pushing literacy because I believe that with literacy and, and, and I ain't just talking about literacy for just reading because we need to be literate on critical thinking. You know, we need to be able to look at a situation and say, oh, this situation ain't working for me and it's not working for my community and it ain't working for my country. And this is an issue that we want to change. And that's part of being literacy too. But my main focus right now with my nonprofit foundation is with literacy. Uh, you know, we go out and feed homeless people downtown LA. Uh, just being active, you know, just staying out, letting the people know that, that I do care about them. Okay, thank you. Thank you. How you doing, Mr. Ross? I'm good, how you doing? All right. Thank Glad you for coming out, too. Yeah, no doubt. Um, since you were in prison, you know that the, uh, the incarceration rate, the disparity between drug dealers and just your average criminal is probably like 70% to 30%. Most Correct. people that are incarcerated are behind bars because of uh, drug dealing. Absolutely. Nonviolent too. Nonviolent, fair to say. And um, I just think a lot of people don't know this as well, that uh, you, know, you, you made reference to the average person to incarcerate an inmate is $45,000 a year. But I don't think a lot of people know that the Corrections Corporation of America is traded actually on the stock market. So there's pretty Unicor. much. Unicor. There's money in incarceration. Absolutely. And they pay, the, they pay the workers 25 cents an hour to do a job on the street that they would be getting maybe 17 to 20 dollars. So is it fair to say that it's more profitable for the government to incarcerate more individuals for a less you know, a nonviolent offense. You think there's more money? This is more to the story about drugs. Like absolutely. I mean, we got to really dig. You know, uh, did you also know that the only person can invest in Unicor? You have to be a government worker, judge, prosecutor, DEA yeah. agent, uh, something like that. There, you can't. You can't. Me and you can't in invest in Unicor. That's a, that's a trip. Thank you very much. No, I'm thank you. That free. was a good one, and, and I, I, I shouldn't have missed that one. What role do you think legalization or decriminalization of drugs should play? Well, we, we look at it like this here. Cigarettes is the worst drug on the planet right now. It's killed more people than any, well, all other drugs put together. You could pile heroin and cocaine and meth and everything together and, and cigarettes outdoes all of them. You also could do a study on what happened when they illegalized cigarettes inside the jailhouse. Do you know one cigarette in the jailhouse was going for $25? The guys were fighting and getting stabbed over cigarettes when they illegalized them, when they took them out to jail. So when we look at that, we know that the illegalization part raises up the violence and everything. Now, how are we gonna handle it together? I don't really know. I can't say that there's one cut way to, to do it, but I definitely know that we've created an artificial price for stuff that's only worth you know, coca leaves is not worth nothing in, in Colombia. They, they'll give them to you just about. So when they come over here is when they become worth all the money. So we got to figure out as a society, how do we get around that? And I, I go back to, we have to educate ourselves. Thank you. No, thank you. Hi. Um, so you, you said earlier that you think education is better than incarceration. Um, and I was wondering if, in the same way you said that if you take one drug kingpin off the streets, 10 more flood into that space to make that money that's not being made anymore, do you feel like more people would be saved from being educated and not selling drugs in the first place, or more people would, uh, would still sell drugs and end up being incarcerated anyways and feel like that's a loophole they can exploit? And also following on from the hip-hop question, uh, a lot of rappers that are fresh off the streets, as it were, say uh, about the drug trade and gang banging that it's a lost cause and as long as there's gangs, there's gonna be gang banging, there's no hope really. Do you feel like there's a solution to that or will it take a million tiny steps to get there? 
Well, I, I feel that, I don't feel that education would bring more people into drugs. I think that education will bring less people to drugs. I think that once people know what they're getting involved with, what the consequences are, the laws, the, the effect that they're going to have on not only their life but others' lives, and, and have an opportunity. You know, we, we got to give opportunity. Without opportunity, uh, uh, you know, you can't have anything. And as for the hip-hop aspect, uh, what I don't like about the hip-hop aspect is when a guy says that he sold drugs who didn't sell drugs. I mean, if you're telling your story, you know, that's one thing. But if you was a correctional officer, <laughs> and, and, and we know in order to be a correctional officer, we know they did a background check on you. You know, we know on your, on your application they ask you, have you ever smoked weed? Have you ever uh, used drugs? And if you checked on there that, that, that you sold drugs and that you used drugs, you're not going to get that job. So when guys who pass those tests come back a year later and start to say, oh, I sold hundreds of kilos of cocaine and I'm a drug kingpin and I did this, I think that that's, and then they don't say that this is all make-believe. You know, when they say that this is really my life, and then they take a story that people in the streets know, and they use that story, I think that that's almost like selling drugs. So I wanted to add to the question. So what I meant by that was, by the incarceration part, is that do you think more people still being in poverty would, would take that opportunity thinking, I can sell drugs and get caught and be educated instead of incarcerated? Do you think more people would take that avenue rather than the people who would initially not start in the first place? Well, I'm saying educate them before they even start selling drugs. Because once a person gets started, it's hard to get them to quit. You know, they say an uh, 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 ounce of prevention is better than a pound of cure. So we want to do the cure before they ever get started. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Hi there. Um, so one of the first questions that someone asked was about whether or not you regret selling drugs, um, considering where it's gotten you to today. And I can't help but think that question was sort of saying that you would be using your story and your past, which involved selling drugs, um, to sort of serve your current place in more of an entertainment industry um, setting. Um, I think that was a really backhanded question, <laughs> but <laughs> largely because I was wondering if you could speak a little bit to why you think your message is different from things, that's other stories that are told in um, a lot of contemporary hip hop or just sort of urban narratives today and how you think your story interacts with that in a positive way as opposed to just a self-serving, trying to get ahead as if that is the only thing that media sort of serves people today. Absolutely, absolutely. That's a good point. Uh, my story being different. I'm one of the few people that can come in front of an audience and say that I sold drugs and I actually did. Because most guys who sell drugs can't tell their story. Most of them have so much time that they can't come back and tell our kids Oh, you shouldn't do this. Like Big Meech. You know, I used to talk to Big Meech before uh, my PO and then found out that I was communicating with guys from prison. Uh, I was getting like 200 phone calls a month from prison and, and they had me stop because they didn't want me communicating with guys in prison for whatever reason. But saying that, they want to come back and tell guys, oh, you don't want to get 30 years. You don't want to get 20 years, but it's no way that they can do it because our system don't allow it. They won't allow those guys to get on an intercom or, or any kind of way and come back and tell you what life is like for them right now. You know, Meech just did, I don't know if you heard of Big Meech, but he's one of the guys that a lot of the rappers refer to right now. And he just did two years in solitary confinement, meaning that he didn't get a telephone, all he could get was mail, he get out of his cell one hour, three days a week to exercise. So. I'm one of the rare people that went through that and that's able right now to stand here and tell you about what it's like. So I do think that my story is unique. Uh, there are some other people that, that could do this, but they're not taking the steps to do it. Uh, and I am. And I feel that this is what I'm supposed to be doing. And, and I don't mind if there's naysayers. You know, I get that a lot. You know, people say, oh, well, why should we listen to you? Or why should we talk to you? You're a drug dealer. 
But who better to tell us about selling drugs than a drug dealer? We're going to learn how to sell drugs or what it was like in South Central from somebody who's never been to South Central. I mean, that's the way we've been getting our policies, and that's the way our policies have been made, and it hasn't been working. So I feel that it's time that we get down to the root and get down with the people who's been getting down and get it straight. I would agree. Thanks. Thank you. It's me again. Hi. <laughs> um. <laughs> well, I like talking to you anyway. Um, why do you think that media portrayal of, like, when we look at, like, the drug trade is always showing the drug dealers as the bad guys and always getting people hooked on when you're talking about how actually like drug users were the one that built you into a drug dealer. Well, you know, media knows that bad news spreads faster than good news. So even though I've been out doing this for four years now, I've been home and I've been, to, I did, one time I did 12 schools in Chicago, the worst parts of Chicago. And I talked to those kids, and those kids came up to me after and said, nobody never told me that before. And you know what? Not one newspaper reported it. Why? Because they don't want good news. They want stuff that's going to sensationalize people, that's going to shock you and make you go, ah. But to hear that a drug dealer is trying to reform himself and reform others is not necessarily the kind of news that gives them that same type of oomph that they're looking for. And that's what I believe that our newspapers don't report what we're doing. One more, last one. Hi. Um, thanks for coming, by the way. This has been really good. So no, far. thank you for coming. Um, so I know this is a really big question, and it seems that your general answer is just broadly education. But what do you think is like the single most effective thing, like community organizers or legislators or just people involved in, um, in poor, um, mostly minority um, neighborhoods can do to improve the economic conditions there? So you're saying who, who should we be going after for, for, for our reforms? Like for what community organizers or legislators, just anybody who can get involved in improving the economic condition of low income neighborhoods? Um, what's the most effective thing that they can do, like very specifically? Well, one of the things that we need to invest money into, into urban neighborhoods. You know, nobody is investing money in there. There's no jobs. Uh, I mean, when you go to, when you go to Watts, in, in any city in, in, this, in the country, they have areas where there's no opportunity. It doesn't look like anything is going on in, in these communities. And we're spending millions and millions of dollars in other places uplifting them and rebuilding them and we're not rebuilding our communities. We're sending all our jobs overseas. You know, everything we use now comes from China. So for the average person, blue collar person, they don't have anywhere to make an income for themselves. So without an income for yourself, then you feel left out of uh, mainstream. Thank you. Let him, let him go. Let's let him go and then that'll be it. <laughs> so we all here, we know that the elephant in the room is the fat, you know, the fake Rick Ross, the rapper and all that stuff, <laughs> the big controversy or whatever. But I mean, after hearing your story and after hearing what you went through, you know, obviously being in prison and stuff, no one wants to go through any of that. So why does the rapper Rick Ross, why does he want to be you? What do you think? Well, I had, a, I had what, what, what we call an underground swell about how people felt about me, uh, how the ghettos felt about me, how the gang members felt about me, and he capitalized on that. He knew that what I did with drugs is I shared. Uh, I didn't take, like my lawyer, he, he, he made a good point one day, and he said, well, Rick, what you did with the drugs is you didn't do like most people would have did. My first kilo I bought, I paid like 70000 for it. When I stopped selling drugs, I was getting kilos for nine five. And what I did, instead of me getting keys for 95, selling them for 75, is I shared the wealth. I was selling keys for like 15. So I shared with a lot of people, and that gave me like an underground reputation that, and it, it later got to the media too. You know, they did a couple uh, news stories on me. Uh, in 80, 88, I think they did a story called LA Gang Godfathers on CBS. Uh, that they did, and they said that I was one of the most elusive, uh, uh, they called me a, a gang godfather at that time. That's what they were calling me. Um, 
before I was able to get the gang thing off of me. But uh, I had an underground swell where people adored me, liked me, cared about me, and he capitalized on that, on that reputation. It's good to hear from the real Rick Ross. <laughs> Thank you. I just want to tell him thanks for coming. I just want to say thank you all for uh, helping me accomplish another one of my goals in life. You know what I'm saying? You just did that today, and I'm overwhelmed. I'll never forget this moment of, of standing in here. Uh, and look for me to do some great things. Uh, I'm, going, I'm going high. I don't know how high I'm going to go, but I'm going places, and I'm going to show them that a guy can start you know, where I started from, and that he really can make amends and, and go to heights. Thank you. Thank you. I uh, just want to say thank you to everyone for coming. And yeah, you saw the website, the t-shirts, any of that. And uh, if you have more questions after, feel free to come up informally. Thank you. Anytime we can take pictures to anybody want to take pictures.